The market is bright red today. Companies like Microsoft are down 4%. Apple's down 3.67%. Google's taking a hit. Amazon's down 5%. Tesla's just getting destroyed down 10% in a single day. This is a brutal day in the market. We have investors that are outright scared, and this is closing up the year of already a terrible year. Now, in times of fear, when investors are running for the exit and the market continues to trade down, I think that gives opportunities. And in this video, I plan to highlight five companies that I think will do well next year. These are companies in my portfolio that I'm particularly bullish on, that I have been buying, and I'm gonna explain the reason that I continue to buy these companies. So we have a lot to get into in this video. I'm gonna be giving a recap of what's happened over the past year, my portfolio's performance, and the companies that I think will do the best next year. We have a lot to jump into, before we get started with it, I have to give a quick shout out for today's sponsor of the video, which is M1 Finance. I started using M1 Finance literally five years ago, back in 2017. I uploaded my first YouTube video in 2019. So I've been using this platform for years, even before ever doing YouTube. The reason that I've been using M1 Finance for so long is because I love their products. M1 Finance offers an ecosystem of tools to manage your wealth. We have M1 Invest here, which I use for my dividend growth portfolio. And M1 Invest is an SEC regulated, US-based member of FINRA and SIPC brokerage. M1 also allows you to use margin and their margin rate is one of the lowest in the industry. I'm able to borrow over $140,000 based off my passive income portfolio. M1 also has a checking account where I keep my emergency savings. And coming early next year, M1 Finance is offering a high yield savings account with a 4.5% annual percentage yield available to M1 Plus members. And the best part is both the checking account and the saving account are FDIC insured. So if you haven't already, try out M1 Finance right now. They're offering both rewards for new signups and and transfers of accounts based on the amount that you're transferring. If you're interested in using M1 Finance, sign up using the link in the description below. Now, before we jump into those five companies, I wanna do a quick portfolio update of what's happened over the past year. 2022 has been a brutal year for investors and year to date, the S&P 500 is down 20.7%. It looks like we're gonna be closing out the year in the red and heavily in the red at that, unless we have some incredible rally but I don't think that's gonna happen. I think we're gonna close out the year next to 20% down. Now, if I switch over to year to date, my portfolio is down 15.9%. So it did a little bit better than the S&P 500, but that's nothing to brag about. We're still down $64,000 this year. That can be painful if you look at that as money vanishing away. In my case, I don't view it that way. I think stock prices are just coming down giving me better opportunity to buy in at more attractive rates. And what I plan on doing is continuing to buy, compounding my share count and growing my passive income. I think during down years, it's good to keep track of a few metrics here to make sure that we're still making progress towards our ultimate goals. For instance, my portfolio, it was just smooth sailing from 2018 all the way up to 2021. We had the minor COVID dip that was a little bit rocky, but I could deposit money, buy the dip, and the Fed quickly bailed out the stock market. So even in 2020, the portfolio value quickly recovered and continued to sail upwards at a rapid pace. But then you see where it topped out, right here in December of 2021. So at the very beginning of the year, we hit around $370,000 in portfolio value. And since then, it's basically just been flat, going up and down. The reason it's flat is my stocks have been going down in value, they've been going down in price, as I've been dollar cost averaging in and reinvesting dividends. So the reinvested dividends and the newly added capital has kept this portfolio value flat, even though we've seen a decline in stock prices. Because like I've said, I continue to deposit money every single month into this portfolio, buying the companies that I think are the most attractively valued. So basically right now, the portfolio is almost at the exact spot that we started as if we've made zero progress. And this can, in some cases, give you the wrong impression that you have made zero progress. That's not really the case. Consider a few things here. Even though my portfolio value is flat from last year to this year, this is the amount of change in dividends that I've earned. I went from $5,456 in dividends in 2021 to now, so far year to date, $7,105 in dividends. That is a 30% increase in the amount of passive income that I've grown. How does that take place? Even though the portfolio value is flat, I've compounded my share count. I've bought more and more into the same companies at higher yields with new added capital and reinvested dividends. So even though the prices have gone down, the amount of economic activity, the amount of capital these companies are paying me, the shareholder, has actually gone up by 30%. 
That is a significant increase in the amount of income that I have. Think about that if you relate it to your job. If you got a 30% raise, wouldn't you consider that a massive, significant raise? A 30% raise is like going from making $70,000 a year to $91,000 a year. That is a massive bump up in income. In this case, it's from 5,400 to 7,100. And that doesn't even factor in all the dividends this year. I still have dividends in the pipeline. I have $188 that's gonna be paid from Texas Roadhouse. Nike's gonna pay me $37. And then Union Pacific's gonna round out the year with a $63 dividend. So this will actually be up closer to 35%. That is a huge increase. So even if the portfolio trades around flat for the next year in 2023, in some ways that can be looked at as a huge advantage. That means that people are becoming bearish they're selling out of stocks, they're pushing down the prices, which pushes up the current yield. And it makes it so I can grow my equity in these companies faster. The dividends will have higher yields and the buybacks will be more effective. So you might flip over to the year-to-date performance and see the big red numbers of being down 10, 15, 20, or even 30% if you're in the S&P 500. And that can cause a heavy feeling of regret and discouragement. But I don't think that should be the case. If you're looking at stocks as future cash flows, the lower the price you can buy into these companies, the better your future expected return is, and the more of the company you actually own, the more of the economic power. So even though this year has been tough, it's been a brutal year, I feel more conviction. I feel more resolute in going into 2023 and building up my portfolio to be far more economically powerful than it's ever been before. And I know that we have a lot of viewers here that have been watching my journey since the very beginning. Since we had just a couple hundred subscribers, the community has grown dramatically, and you've been able to see publicly and transparently both my successes and my mistakes. And I'm gonna continue to do that in the future. 2023, it's gonna be no different. I'll be sharing the journey, I'll be sharing my investments, I'll be showing you when I win and when I lose, I'll be trying to do self-assessment and recommitting to becoming an even better investor. One thing that I will promise you too, is you are gonna see this portfolio over the coming years, transform into this $300,000 portfolio into a $1 million plus portfolio. I've said that I'm gonna do that before, and I say it again. This will be a $1 million seven-figure portfolio, and you're gonna see that play out. You'll see the power of dividends reinvested and of buying stable compounding companies. Now, when I jump into this list of five companies, what I'm not doing is listing out five companies that I think have traded down a little bit, and they're gonna have a price swing upwards. I'm not listing out five companies companies that I think are going to be 10 Xers. I'm listing out companies that are set up really good for the near term future and they have unassailable modes. These companies are called compounders. These are the type of companies I'm focusing on in this portfolio. They have strong franchise durability. That is brand recognition and pricing power. High returns on capital employed. That means that if they invest $100 into their business, they expect to get $120 or $130 back within the same year. High returns on capital employed is a must. These companies have reoccurring revenue. They sell lots of small products, reoccurring purchases. They do not sell one-time purchase hard durable goods like cars, airplanes, or refrigerators. These companies have minimal financial leverage. That means even if we do have a credit crunch and they can't take out any additional debt, they will not go belly up. And then they have low cyclicality, I don't like highly volatile companies. And then finally, they return capital back to the shareholder by both paying a growing dividend and typically doing buybacks as well. Compounders are what we're looking for, and we're looking for the best compounders selling at the best price. So let's go through the list here. I have a number of compounders in my portfolio, but I outline the top five that I think are the best suited for next year. The first one is Union Pacific. Union Pacific is one of the class one behemoth railroad companies, and it is a clear monopoly. It is basically what's considered a monopoly shared, like an oligopoly. If we look up Union Pacific using Qualtrum, we get a bunch of data about the fundamentals of this company. Now, Qualtrum is a website that I created. It's part of the Patreon membership. If you wanna try this out for free, I'll leave a link in the description of this video. But what we can do is first look at a couple key metrics of Union Pacific. The stock, first of all, is trading at a relatively reasonable valuation. I would say it's even cheap. It's at an 18 forward PE ratio. Could it go lower? Of course, it could contract a little bit, but overall, that's a pretty low yield. I think the company's undervalued based on a PE ratio. Even better, when we look at the free cash flow yield, with compounders, the range that we're targeting is around 4 to 5%. 
That's a really strong yield for a company, especially when the company has a true free cash flow yield and isn't bumping that up by paying all their employees with stock-based compensation. A 4.6% Free cash flow yield is really good. And part of that is because the company has sold off a little bit this year. It's down 16%. So we have pretty attractive valuation metrics here. But let's go ahead and look at the overall business. This is really what discourages a lot of investors from jumping into Union Pacific. They see that the revenue's flattened out a little bit. It might grow one to 3% per year on average. And that's a little bit discouraging. But at the Joseph Carlson Show, we know that revenue does not pay you dividends. Revenue doesn't do buybacks profitability does. Union Pacific has been growing its free cash flows dramatically over the past decade by doing efficiency improvements in the way that they run their railway. So basically, even though they have the same pool of revenue, they're keeping more of that revenue every single year by doing efficiency improvements. So we can see that this is a great example of a company where the revenue is completely flat, but the cash flows have gone up on average 8.8% per year. That's a pretty dramatic increase in cash flows. 2008, they're earning 900 million. Last year, they earned 6.1 billion. Really cool to see that from Union Pacific. Then if we flip over and we factor in stock-based compensation to see how much they're paying their employees in stock and see how much they're diluting us, there's basically nothing, which means that basically all of this cash flow is money that can be returned back to the shareholder. It is undiluted free cash flow. And that means that this free cash flow yield is a true 4.6% free cash flow yield. Now moving on to other profitability metrics, we have the net income, that looks good, it's going up moderately over the past decade. We have the earnings per share, likewise going up moderately over the past decade. Now if we switch over to quarterly and we look at the cash and debt profile of the company, this is something that also may scare off investors. The company carries a lot of debt if you just look at the total numbers. As of last quarter, they had $31.4 billion in debt and they only had $1.3 billion in cash. So they have way more debt than cash. Last year, it generated $11.84 billion in EBITDA. So even though it has a staggering $30 billion in debt, they could really pay that debt down in like three years. That's not really over levered. Companies like Domino's, for example, have around twice the amount of leverage as Union Pacific. So even though that number is a little bit scary, in my opinion, I don't think it's anything to be concerned about. I think they can easily manage it. Next, we can look at how this company returns capital. We can look at the dividend growth of the company. The compound annual growth rate of the dividend is 14% much faster than the S&P 500. So Union Pacific is a much faster dividend grower than the average company in SPY. And they're not only returning capital through paying a dividend, they're also doing a ton of buybacks. Because like I said, the stock is pretty cheap. And when a stock is cheap, it makes sense for the executives to start buying back their own shares. That's what they've been doing over the past decade. Union Pacific trades at this sub 20 PE ratio, which allows them to buy back their own shares, eating away at 4% of the share count outstanding over the past decade. That is some heavy buybacks. That's around double the speed of share reduction than a company like Google. And then finally, the last thing that I like to look at here is the returns on capital employed. This is the metric that Terry Smith really focuses on. Warren Buffett has said, it's the most important factor in how good a business is. This company has moderate to really good returns on capital employed. It's nothing like an Estee Lauder, it's nothing like a Domino's, but it's up there in the high 15s, 16s range over the past decade, and that's good enough. I think it has pretty decent returns on capital employed, especially for being an outright monopoly. So Union Pacific, in my opinion, is a company that I'm happy to be buying right now. I've been adding to it in the portfolio, buying it every single week. Anybody that's been following what I've been doing knows that I've been buying more and more into these railroads, and I'm happy to see them trade down. A lot of investors, again, would get discouraged if the companies are selling off. This is something I'm happy to see, because Union Pacific and Canadian Pacific, these railways, they're gonna be around for the next 20, 30, or 40 years at a minimum. So we have number one, Union Pacific. Number two, we have Microsoft. This company continues to trade down. I'm now over $5,000 in the red as we're going through the big tech sell-off. We have Apple trading down and Microsoft trading down, and this can create a good opportunity if you're wanting to own a high quality compounder. We can take a look at Microsoft here. This company again is trading down for all different macroeconomic reasons. We have a note here from Qualtrum that shares of companies in the broader tech sector are trading down amid overall market weakness following better than expected US GDP and jobless claims data, which have added to the concerns of an overheating economy and tight labor market. Weakness in Micron following Q1 earnings has also put pressure on chip stocks. So there you have it. We have all this, this macroeconomic reasons of why this company is trading down. 
But most of these things are temporary. The Fed interest rates, the job data, that's all stuff that comes and goes. Microsoft is going to be around for another 10 years. So if we look past this macroeconomic headwind, this may create an interesting entry point. Right now, Microsoft is trading at a 27 Ford PE. This is trading in one of the ranges that's the cheapest over the past five years, going down into the mid 20s. The price to sales is a nine. Usually Microsoft trades around a 12. The free cash flow yield is 3.6 for a company this high quality. So all the metrics right now look attractive. Doesn't mean it can't go lower. It means they look attractive right now. And the company's down 27% year to date. So if we look at Microsoft, is this company a compounder? Does Microsoft have brand recognition? recognition and pricing power? Of course it does. Microsoft has immense brand recognition and pricing power. This is how they're able to bump up their revenue year after year. Does Microsoft have high returns on capital employed? The returns on capital employed of Microsoft are extremely high. In fact, you have to pay attention to the X axis here. It bottoms out at 10%. That's already a very high low for a return on capital employed. Airlines, for example, basically never get up to this territory. Microsoft's low end is on the high end of major industries. And most of the time, Microsoft has returns on capital employed above 20%, even going up to 25 and 30%. They continue to climb upwards. Microsoft has, of course, reoccurring revenue. Around 80% of it is subscription revenue. Do they have minimal financial leverage? Microsoft literally has no financial leverage. They have more cash on hand than debt. And even if the Activision deal closes, they'll still not be levered. Is Microsoft a low cyclicality? Microsoft does have some cyclicality. It works with the overall economy. So you're going to see some level of cyclicality here, but I think it's lower than most companies. Usually the Microsoft suite of products is one of the last things to go if a company's cutting budget. And does Microsoft return capital back to the shareholder? Look at the free cash flow that it has to work with. Every quarter it's earning 16, 17, 20 billion dollars in free cash flow. If we factor in stock-based compensation and take a look at how that looks, we see that stock-based compensation eats up maybe one to two billion dollars per quarter, but that still leaves them with a substantial amount of excess free cash flow. With that, they can pay dividends and they are paying a growing dividend. And they do some level of share buybacks, not as much as Apple and other companies, but they're reducing the amount of shares outstanding anywhere from half a percent to one and a half percent. So overall, I consider Microsoft really well set up for next year. It's a company that I already have a large position in. But if it continues to trade down into these ranges, I'll continue to add to this position. My number three dividend stock for 2023 is Vici. Vici is a company that I think is really set up well for next year. I like the management of this company. I like the huge dividend it continually pays me. Vici is a company that I like the historical performance of. It's been outperforming the market, especially when you factor in dividends. This thing paid like a 7% yield at the start of the year, and it's still up 9%. Over the past two years, it's up 27%, again, not factoring in that reinvested dividend. That is a huge component of Vici's total returns. But as investors, we're not looking at the past, we're trying to look at the future. What is gonna happen with Vici in 2023? Well, first of all, let me just make a note here that Vici is not a true compounder. It's one of the few non-compounder companies in my portfolio. And the reason why is because on the compounder checklist, we have number four, minimal financial leverage, and Vici's not that company. Vici does require debt to grow its business. That is, in fact, an integral part of how it grows. So this is one company that does have a chance of going bankrupt if it's not able to get credit and if it's not able to collect rent because it has big interest payments. And that is a risk you must know when investing in Vici. Any real estate company that uses a lot of leverage is at higher risk of going bankrupt than a company like Microsoft that has no leverage. Now, having said that, I think that's very unlikely. And I think the company is very well positioned to have very stable rent collection into 2023. We first know that Vici is a real estate company that basically owns the Vegas Strip. So if you're not bullish on the Vegas Strip and Vegas in general, you probably shouldn't be investing in Vici. I am, however, very bullish on Vegas as well. And I think that Vici has capitalized on this market during a time that was really good to be buying these properties, which was right during the COVID scare. So Vici was scooping up real estate piece after real estate piece while real estate was not in style. Everybody was concerned about real estate because of the virus. So they got really good deals on their properties. And then we see the recovery in Vegas happening. We have things like this next year. With Formula One, Las Vegas gears up to be the new car capital of America. And the promos for this just look insane. The renderings look crazy. This is gonna be a massive spectacle. <laughs>
Lights out, and away we go. Brilliant. Magnificent. Madness. Formula One and the Vegas King. Now, outside of Formula One, we have the tech convention, CES. We have Taylor Swift concerts. We have so many things going on in that one area, so much entertainment, that I don't think Vici's gonna have any problems collecting rent. And when you're doing real estate analysis, when you're looking at rental income properties, the most important question you probably have to ask yourself is, what is the likelihood of this company continuing to collect rent 100% of it on time? That is a question that you need to ask yourself with any triple net lease REIT company, if they're gonna be able to collect rent even during a difficult economy. With Vegas, these properties are actually less cyclical. Entertainment properties collect rent all around the year, even during recessions. So I see a very high likelihood of Vici continuing to collect 100% of rents next year, and that makes the yield a real yield, a 4.5% dividend yield starting right now. And then you look at the fact that they're also raising the dividend by 9% per year. So you have a 5% starting yield, a 9% dividend raise. That's overall a very attractive return just from payments alone, even when you don't consider capital appreciation. When you factor in capital appreciation as well, and the fact that these properties go up in value over time, that's just one more way you get returns with Vici. My number four 2023 dividend stock pick is a little bit of a contrarian one. We once again have predictions that we're going into a recession, that people are being laid off, that everything is doom and gloom and there's dark rain clouds ahead. And that means that people aren't gonna do anything fun like going out to eat or doing anything that's experiential. And I have a contrarian pick. I think that Texas Roadhouse is in particular set up to do really well next year. I think that Texas Roadhouse is still a sleeper stock that will outperform expectations. Now I've talked about Texas Roadhouse a lot, so I'm not gonna do a full analysis on this company, but I just wanna highlight a couple things that I think are important that I haven't gone over. Anytime we're doing analysis on a stock and we're trying to see how it will do in a recession, I think the best way to determine that is by simply looking at past recessions, seeing what happened. There's no data better than real data and observing what's happened in history because many times history does not really repeat, but it might rhyme. It might work out very similar to how it has in the past. If we look at the case of Texas Roadhouse, this company is a restaurant company, which at first thought makes you believe it's cyclical. It's susceptible to recessions, but then you open up the earnings per share of the company and just take a look at it. We have 2002 right here. We have that recession and major market panic and the stock had growing earnings every single year. From 2003 to 2004, they went down slightly and then they accelerated in 2005. There's no problems here, no issues in the dot-com bubble. Then we fast forward to 2007. This is the Michael Burry, big short territory, housing collapse, everything bad, high unemployment, 8% unemployment, and earnings per share grew. And then they grew again, and then they grew again. How will this company do during the next recession? Well, there's obviously no way of knowing, but if we observe history, we see that Texas Roadhouse has figured something out. In the past two recessions, they've had literally no issue, no earnings per share drop, no real problems with their company. We can also look at their revenue growth and find the same thing. Steady revenue growth year after year, even during those recessionary years, they continue to grow revenue. So this isn't a perfect science. I can't say with certainty that they'll be completely fine during the next recession, because there's always something that could happen that's never happened in history. This is a company that I consider to be far more resilient than what Wall Street thinks. And I think that Wall Street doesn't pay much attention to this restaurant because it's a smaller market cap company. It's not that flashy. And so they don't do much analysis on it. And I think the reason that Texas Roadhouse does particularly well in recessionary environments is because this company is so focused on value. It's focused on giving you a lot of bang for your buck. You get a lot of food, you get great service, and you don't overpay. Usually customers of Texas Roadhouse leave the restaurant feeling like they had good value. And so I think that plays a major role. Now Texas Roadhouse right now is trading at a 24 PE ratio. I still think Texas Roadhouse is cheap even though it's up 6% year to date. The free cash flow yield is 4.4%, 
which again, I think is an attractive valuation for this company. Some other quick metrics we can look at, the company's growing dividends much faster than the overall market. In fact, it's one of the fastest dividend growers in my entire portfolio with a 10 year, 17% dividend growth rate. And just recently, something new that Texas Roadhouse is doing is share buybacks. And they bought back 4% of their shares outstanding because they have more money right now than they know what to do with. So not only are they raising that dividend like crazy, but they're also buying back their shares anytime the company becomes cheap. And the returns on capital employed are pretty good, especially for a restaurant, right in that 16 to 18% range. That's on the higher end of restaurants and I think they'll be able to maintain it. If you're buying into this company though, be aware it's a more volatile holding. It could trade down because it's a smaller market cap company. The number five dividend paying stock that I'm focused on for 2023 is Costco. Nothing new. I've talked about this company many times. It's one of my favorite companies in the entire world. I think they just nail every part of their business from the management to how they treat the employees, how much brand equity they have, how many good relationships they build with customers. I think Costco is one of a kind. And right now the company's seeing weakness in its stock price. It's down 18% this year. So nothing crazy, but it's down a little bit more than you'd expect from a consumer defensive company. The biggest reason why, obviously, has to do with valuation. Costco is fundamentally as strong as a company can get. It's one of the strongest fundamental companies in the market, but the question is always on valuation. And right now, Costco trades around a 30 to a 33 Ford PE ratio, depending on your earnings estimates. That's a little on the high end, that's actually much lower than Costco has recently traded at. Typically, it's in the 40s range. The free cash flow yield of the company is 1.73%, which again is a lower free cash flow yield than most companies. The company is growing its net income, earnings per share. It's completely unlevered. They have more cash on hand than both their capital leases and their long-term debt, which is something rare to see with retailers. Most of them leverage up to build more and more stores as fast as possible. Costco will never do that. They've said openly that they do not take risks. This company hates risk. They hate taking chances with your money. They will do things that they know get a good return, and they will do it without using leverage, which makes it so that their risk is minimal. And then one of the best metrics about this company is the returns on capital employed. Looking at this over the past decade, this is the 15% line. It's almost always above that 15% line, which is great. And then moving from 2015, it's above a 20%. So they're actually increasing the amount of returns on capital employed that they have as time goes on. This is a sign of incredibly good discipline from the management. They will only invest your money into things that have high expected future returns. So this is a company where you're not gonna get the best returns in a six month period. I don't think that Costco is gonna race up two and three X anytime soon, but it's one that I think has low downside, a very long runway of growth. I think the company will be two or three times as big in the next 20 to 30 years. And I think it will give stable returns to investors over that time period. So that rounds out my top five picks for 2023. Maybe I'll do a video next year that shows a follow-up of what happened. That'd be interesting to see. So that's all for now. If you enjoyed this episode, you can head over to the Patreon to join us, to have more content, more exclusive videos. Most of them are an hour long. They're a bit more relaxed. It's just me answering questions, talking with the community here. It's a lot of fun and you get access to Qualtrim, which is that whole suite of software. And best yet, there's no risk. You can try it out risk-free. It's cancel anytime. I'll see you there.